Uh, we're going to talk about mass. M uh, is, uh, as with most symbols in physics, gets used for multiple things, but the most common use for M is to refer to the mass of something. Um, what we don't know about mass is probably uh, more interesting. Um, ma M is for mass. So I've got uh, a nice sphere, which is uh, a Chinese metal ball for relaxing me, and this weighs as I put it in the scales, 140 grams, as you can see. It's a, a complicated concept to explain because mass has two, uh, two effects. There are two things that, that, that mass uh, matters for. And this is what people normally mean by mass. A solid object which is really heavy and compact. But the dictionary says that there are two different definitions, according to Chambers. One is gravity. Um, the more massive an object is, the stronger its pull of gravity is. This is the mass which acts downwards, pulling this towards the Earth. And if it's a heavier object, that is, it has more mass, or if I put on weight, as I stand on the scales, I weigh more. This is a smaller mass, which came from the Red Nose Day a few years ago, and you put that on there and it hardly moves, and I weigh it at about five grams. So you can actually measure the difference between these two quantities. And the other is how much something doesn't like being pushed around. So if you've got something that has a very high mass, it, has, it really doesn't like being, you know, you have to push it very hard to get it to move at all. Now there's another aspect of the mass, according to my version of Chambers' dictionary, and that is its reluctance to move. If something has a very low mass, um, then, then it's very easy to make it move. So if I put these objects here, and try to measure how reluctant this object is to move, I can flick that, and I'll do this with full vigour, and it really moves. Did you see that? I did. did you? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'll pick it up again. <laughs> and in some ways, it's, it's sort of one of, the, one of the great unknowns of physics, one of the great unexplained things of physics, is to why mass matters for both of these things. And it's basically, you can use the same number to explain both how strong something's gravitational pull is, and also how much it doesn't like being pushed around. And now I'll do it with this one, with the same vigour, although I'm very reluctant to, because I know. <laughs> And you can see that it moves, but it's more reluctant to move and doesn't go with the same speed. In fact, it hurt my hand. That is called the inertia of the object, and it's the inertial mass of the object. It's the reluctance to move. In, in the dictionary, it said it's the resistance, but I prefer, prefer to think of the object as wanting to stay still, to be inert, and it wants to stay where it is. So those are the aspects of mass that we know about right from our childhood. But the really fundamental question that hasn't been answered is what causes mass? That's, again, uh, there you're, you're venturing into very deep water, I have to say. Uh, if you really want an answer to that question, you have to ask a particle physicist, because they're the people who really understand these fundamental properties of matter. Uh, as far as an astronomer is concerned, it's just the property that, that objects have, uh, and we're quite happy to accept it as such. Um, and this is one of the questions that we're hoping that the Large Hadron Collider might answer um, if it uncovers the Higgs boson. This is a big particle that we think might be involved with making objects actually have mass, but nobody has actually seen it yet. What is the origin of the mass of the electron, or the mass of the proton, or the mass of a quark, or any fundamental particle? Because there is no... Um, there is a theory, but the theory hasn't been properly tested, so it's still a hypothesis. There's a theory due to Peter Higgs of Edinburgh that says there's a huge field throughout the universe permeating everywhere with a particle associated called the Higgs boson, and it is the presence of this field coupling to each particle which gives them mass. But nobody yet knows whether this theory is right, whether there's one Higgs boson, two or whatever, and that's the current state of play. People have asked this question. William Waldegrave set a bet about 10 years ago, well, it must be more because he was in the Conservative government, to ex that he would give a prize to the best explanation of what a Higgs boson was. And the winning answer, or something like the winning answer, was that imagine you go into a, a cocktail party and you're very attractive, so you found a £10 note, and you're saying, I've just found £10, who dropped it? Everybody would come rushing towards you. Uh, and then, if you tried to move through the party, you would be surrounded by people and find it very difficult to move. Whereas if you um, came in and said, I've just lost £10, um, has anybody found it? You'll find everybody move away from you, and that would be an anti-Higgs boson. So I think it, the, the, the simple-minded picture, which has no mathematics, is this idea of accreting mass to you because you are attractive in some way. Uh, just as the £10 note would be attractive.
And so you find it difficult to move, and it's your reluctance to move against all these people who are clustering around you, which is a simple mental picture I have. Well, in astronomy, oftentimes we don't use the most sensible units for measuring mass. So in, in truth, sometimes we talk about measuring things like the mass of the sun in grams or, or kilograms. Um, which gets into very, very large numbers. As with everything in astronomy, the numbers get so big that they become completely meaningless. So it's you know, one with an awful lot of zeros after it. Well, the Large Hadron Collider is meant to be working at energies such that they would be able to detect the Higgs boson if it's there. The energy range covers it, but then unfortunately, as soon as they got it up and running, uh, the helium leaked out and the whole thing well, there's a huge amount of damage and it's gone back by about six months. So in the next few years, maybe we'll detect the Higgs boson and then I'll find out more about it and whether it's right or not. In my line of work, I'm talking about the mass of galaxies or even clusters of galaxies. And these are some of the largest objects that we know about in the whole universe. So what we tend to do is actually measure things not in kilograms, but actually in units that are kind of more associated with the things we're interested in. So, for example, the main mass unit that astronomers use is the solar mass, the mass of the sun. And that's kind of a useful number because, for example, if you figure out that some galaxy weighs 10 billion times the mass of the sun, that immediately gives you a feeling that it's probably an object that's probably got about 10 billion stars like the sun in it. Even then, the sun is so small compared to these large numbers that we have to talk in terms of billions or thousands of billions or millions of billions of times the mass of the sun. I, I grew up in the 50s and 60s and then we all had imperial units and so I had to learn grains and ounces and pounds and stone. What well, after stone, hundredweights and tons. Do you remember all those? They were very difficult. There are 16 grains in an ounce and 16 ounces in a, in a pound and 14 pounds in a stone. All these things. And so you learnt your multiplication tables. But now we use kilograms, metres, seconds for everything and rationalise everything. Uh, and it's certainly nicer, but there's more flavour to the old units because when you talk about grains, you're really talking about going back to Babylonian times and measuring things in terms of grains of wheat or whatever. Or if you go back to Roman times, you talk about hands and feet and yards. And in Spanish, the inch is called the pulgada, which is just this part of your thumb. Because objects in astronomy can get to be pretty big, you end up with rather a lot of solar masses. But for some reason, we don't actually use anything much heavier than the mass of the sun. Occasionally, people kind of use a typical mass of a galaxy. Um, but, but more often than not, we just measure everything in, in solar units, the mass of the sun. So it's not always the most efficient way, um, but at least it brings it back to something that we can actually comprehend in our heads. Can you, can you comprehend the mass of the sun in your head? Uh, yeah, probably not. <laughs> there is a, a feeling that this was a French system set up by Napoleon, and it was one of the best things he ever did in many ways, inventing the meter, inventing the kilogram. Um, and somehow the, the English still love to have... Uh, the old-fashioned pound, but if you go and live in France, they'll, they'll, they'll talk about, uh, I would like to have a demi-livre, which is half a pound of something in French. So these old units that you grew up with and are part of the language and culture, they stay even if you have been exposed to metric systems.